right. Well, hi, everybody. This is um, the Programming Quantum Computers Book Club. We're uh, on uh, chapter four this week, and uh, we are going to work through the code in chapter four with our little group. Uh, we may have some people joining in late, um, or if you're watching this video, you know, you can feel free to work through and go into our Slack and take a look at it. Oh, hi, there's Nuri. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to work through the problem. And uh, Jeremy, and, Jeremy and I did a little bit of preparation and we have um, a visual tool that um, Jeremy came up with that we're going to use to work through this problem in chapter four. Um, this is a pretty gnarly problem. Um, so hopefully the visual tool that we've got will be helpful. And we're also going to use two different environments. We're going to use kind of like the book um, hat does. So I don't know if you have the book handy, but um, the book starts actually with the IBM environment, um, if, you, if you're not remembering the chapter. So it starts with the IBM um, environment. As you run it, doesn't really explain what it does. It says just hold on and run it. Um, and then it goes into the, um, the JavaScript environment. Um, and then it breaks it down step by step. And that's where we'll be showing the tool. So we're kind of going to hand off. And then at the end, it comes back to the IBM environment and it explains why you need to run this on an actual quantum environment rather than a simulator, um, because you do get different results, um, which is another wrinkle to this problem. So, so speaking of the problem, what is it? Um, it's, uh, I didn't bother making slides. So um, it's quantum uh, teleportation. And again, if it's not in the front of your mind, if you've been doing other things, um, quantum um, teleportation uh, is defined as, um, as it says here on page 70 in the book, um, let me just give my glasses, uh, it means the ability to transport the precise state, the magnitude and relative phase of one qubit to another. Okay, and that is something that is, was hard for me to keep in mind, so I wanted to start with that. We're, um, we're translate, we're trans uh, porting the, the state, which is defined as the magnitudes, plural, and the relative phase. Um, so the idea is to take the information from one qubit and put it into the second qubit. Um, another way to think about this is, this is how you share information, because in the world of quantum, you cannot copy, as we well know, because when you um, read, you destroy. So um, this teleportation is a common pattern, um, as you'll see when you get through more of the book in um, sharing information when you're writing quantum programs. So, all right, what does it say here? Do, 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 do. Okay, so it goes on to explain how it works. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by sharing the IBM um, uh, version here and let me just share this and of course I got this by going to the section here and selecting the open QSAM. Now one of the things is that that's really important and I don't know if you guys picked up on this when you read the chapter, the code is different. So it physically has different code from the open QSAM to the simulator. And that's because the operations that you can run on actual quantum hardware are slightly different than what you can run in a simulator. So that's a nuance that um, the book doesn't cover super um, in depth. So in any case, when uh, you copy this code and you paste it in here, um, uh, what you can do, of course, is you can inspect it if you want to, which you might remember from earlier, where you can run through the inspector and you can, which is similar to what you can do in the JavaScript, um, but you cannot run it from here. So what the book recommends that you do is that you write off run it. So if you're not familiar with this, you click set up and run. And then another nuance that is important is by default, you are actually running it on a simulator. So you can see here, it's the Q, QSAM simulator which you can run it, but you will get a different result than the book if you don't run it on an actual 
um, IBM uh, quantum computer. So that's again, something to be aware of. So if you pick a quantum computer and you say, for example, Santiago, and then you're gonna specify um, the shots or the, the amount of times it's gonna run. And then you're gonna go ahead and you're going to run it here. If I can get this. And then that will set up a job and you can see over here it's pending. And as you go in, you can see it's queued and then it will run once. And again, it's cookbook style, right? Once it's run and it really depends on how busy their job queue is, then you get um, a result. And again, you can always check yourself. I don't know, hopefully everybody can see the screen resolution okay. These are our jobs I ran on the simulator and this is an actual job. Um, you can either give it a name or it'll give a, a unique ID. So once you run it, here is the actual result. Now the book does not explain the actual result until the end of the chapter. So it's written in a little bit of a disconnected way because it says, go ahead and run this. You should get a result that looks like this. And it's important you run it on the actual hardware. And now we're gonna go and we're going to run on JavaScript and, 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 and break it down. And then at the end of the JavaScript, it comes back to this and helps you interpret what these results mean. The one thing to take from this at this point is that this is like all sort of quantum operations, not deterministic. So this is the result run for this particular batch run. And so you get these frequencies. So there is, it's called error or there's, it's called noise. Um, whenever you have a quantum application, it is always, it's more like a machine learning application in that you get a, a, a varied result. And um, again, this is a very new thing for programmers that are coming out of deterministic programming, but this is key to the nature of it and important. So um, I'm gonna pause here and just see if um, Jeremy has anything to add or if anybody has any questions before I switch over to the JavaScript. Um, I don't think I have anything to add at this point. Um, I, I have found the IBM environment to be interesting and fun, <laughs> but the notation is definitely different. So um, that, that sphere is kind of cool, but I'm, still learning how to read it at this point. Oh, one other point about this, I'll just go ahead and share again and, um, and uh, tell you this, uh, is that um, when you are in this view, um, if you click see more details on a job, it has a, um, and I think we mentioned this in our earlier video, but this becomes more important as we get more complex programs. Um, it has a, uh, the original circuit, and then has the transpiled circuit. So again, you may remember that the H is the hat, of course, but the transpilation here, there is no had. So on this particular hardware, um, a had is implemented as a series of other types of quantum operations, which again, I think would be very important if you were actually doing any sort of production quantum uh, to understand how this is being um, actually executed. Um, another thing that's interesting here is if you look, you can see the original code, which is quite terse. It's only 37 lines. Um, and then the transpiled circuit where, you know, again, you can see like on line 20, you have an H, which is a had, and then that gets um, uh, translated here into these kind of operations. It's not a direct match, but you can kind of see. And then just- So those are the rotations? Yeah, yep. And you can see um, also that you have, if you're more comfortable with Python, this is like a C style notation. Um, I actually like this personally because I'm, I use Python quite a lot. And so this is just easier for me to read. Um, so, you know, again, just a little technique when I'm trying to figure things out. Sometimes I will come into the IBM uh, environment and I will look at the um, Qiskit library, because I just find it to be very readable. Might be because I'm just comfortable with Python. So, so just some tooling stuff. All right. So, so uh, Jeremy, I, I, that, that is exactly, the diagram you made is exactly the section of the book that I thought should have been in chapter one and a half. It's, it's 
oh so much more descriptive of what's going on with the bits that we called qubits, but they're actually the you know, interval selector and the wording around all of this. I suspect that even in this group, we should be able to come up with a more instructive set of names for things that would make everybody's life better. Well, that's what we're working on. So yeah. one, of, one of the things Jeremy and I were struggling with is um, the book is trying to give us a visual intuition around some very complex math. And um, I have taken linear algebra relatively recently. Um, so I have some you know, familiarity with matrix operations, but I don't have them like at the front of my hand because I don't use them every day. And so uh, as comparison, I was watching a Kids Kit series um, and they just went heavy into the matrix operations. Like they did the math completely, which is for a certain audience, but I think it's really more of an academic audience. And so as Jeremy and I were thinking about how to present this rather complex problem that we're going to look at, we were really focusing on how to improve, like you're saying, Nuri, the names and the visual intuition, because, you know, that is really where the book is trying to go with this. And we feel that we can really add value to our own learning and possibly other people who might be watching. So I'm actually kind of excited to um, see how you guys uh, uh, respond. And so we're going to start with the exercise, I'm gonna start it and then kind of turn it over to Jeremy. Cause basically it came to, I was stuck on a certain point and I was like, why is this? And he said, this is the thing that I use. And I said, oh, cool. And so that's, we're just gonna follow the process. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna share again. Um, kind of added to that real quick. Uh, when I've been asking questions about quantum and I threw something on Stack Overflow, like I don't understand the swap circuit. <laughs> to me, as a computer scientist, if I do a read operation, it should not affect the item I'm reading, and yet the swap circuit actually does. And uh, I preface it saying I'm coming at this from a computer science point of view, not a physicist point of view. Um, and what I found is some people try to respond, and I really appreciated that. But um, when you get right down to why do some of these operations do what they do, you very quickly dive into the physics side of things. And uh, I think while that may be a great understanding fundamentally of what's going on underneath the scenes, I really appreciate the book. And I think this group trying to translate that into what makes sense for computer scientists, because as a computer scientist, we're not evaluating the electrical impulses running over a transistor. Uh, we don't care about any of that. And, uh, and I, it's this, I think what, what's so fun about this group is we're trying to take a very new complex idea and how do we as a team translate that to something our peers can run with, so. Well, I don't- And kudos, kudos to my uh, schooling in uh, computer science. We did learn electronics and we did put a voltmeter to a circuit. And when you put a voltmeter to a circuit, you draw, you draw some current and it does affect the voltage in the circuit. Minimally yeah. so maybe, but yeah. it does. Yeah. So th those, those should not be foreign concepts. And I think it's, it's good to bring it back in. Yeah, so, so you guys, I think all know of the work that I've done teaching children how to program. And um, you know, a big part of introducing the concepts of programming to kids is of the visual intuition. And so I'm particularly interested in, you know, improving the visual intuitions because, again, one of the challenges in understanding the electronics and the math is, you know, spending the amount of time. And again, if you, if you want to do that, um, I link this in the Slack. There is a, a really good article, actually, um, that is in uh, Towards Data Science on Medium. And uh, what it does is it does a very good walkthrough of the math. And here it recommends kind of the same things I'm recommending, three blue, one brown for linear algebra. Anyway, so uh, just kind of giving you the highlights of it. And this is kind of how I saw the kids kit being taught as well. It goes to the level of the not notation and then it, you know, it shows you what these common um, uh, values are represented mathematically. And then it starts going into tensor operations, which again is linear algebra, right? Um, so it, it either, yes, you've had it and you recognize it or you just have to trust me, it is. <laughs> um, 
but but for example um the one i always like to do is the is the knot because that's real easy to understand um so yeah so here's here's a c knot so this is the matrix operation of a c knot but again the book isn't really taking this approach so um I think that that's going to be important in terms of a journey in learning how to be a production quantum developer, but kind of like what I did with the kids was to have the visual layer. Um, I feel like that was useful in that situation. And as Matt was saying, what we're trying to do here is provide kind of a ladder for traditional programmers. So rather than going directly to the math, I'm happy to link references and stuff like that. I feel like if we can be successful with this visual layer and building out and building on what the authors have done, that we would be providing value. So that's kind of what we're going for, basically. So anyway, so let's let's go back here talking about this to our, our task at hand. So what this is, is, is teleportation, which as defined is allowing the state of a qubit to be um, shared. And uh, again, I'm just gonna kind of go through till my stuck point, and then I'm gonna um, switch it off to Jeremy, if that's cool with the group. So um, in just running the program to execute it here, the beginning is very familiar. So obviously line uh, nine, we're um, setting up the environment. We've got the qubits. We're initializing these two to zero. So that's all new, not new news. One of the things I like about this example is um, the authors took the time of making methods, um, which I like that because it really had adds to the readability. So basically the, the concept, as you can see here, is this first operations will entangle, the next will um, prepare for the qubit that is gonna have the information that is going to be made available for the recipient. Um, the next will be the sending set of operations, and then it will be the receiving set of operations and the verification. So I like that in terms of readability. So that was a good start. So I was like, okay, I get, I get that. I get the setup. Okay. And now we are up to the entangle section. So the entangle is, should be kind of familiar because we had this in previous chapter. The one question I had about this, which um, is just a readability question, I was not intuitive to me that this was two pipe four. And um, that's what that is. And how you can tell is if you go like that and you can see then it just it initializes all of them. Another way to write this um, is just a small thing, which you guys probably already have thought of, but it, it's more readable to me if it's like that. Um, and then it basically does the same thing, but it's initializing this one and this one. So that was a small point. So then uh, we have our label. And then um, if we start here, of course, we can see in circle notation, we're here. And then we go here and then we had this. And uh, then we're gonna entangle, which is gonna swap. Um, and then we are done with this section right here. So once we got to that point, the next thing is, this is preparing um, basically a transmission wire, if you will, by entangling, which I didn't exactly know why, but I just accepted the concept, it's preparing. Then the next step was to take this qubit um, and do preparation um, so that it could be sent. And so that's this section right here. So Alice is writing this qubit and then she's doing these three operations so she's hatting and then uh, doing this uh, phase and then hatting again. Um, and then the next section here is she's sending. So here she's sending with a C naught. And then this is where I could not understand why she needed to do this had. And so I was um, removing the had, um, not really understanding. And then she needs to uh, read at that point. So I was pretty much following up to there, but then I was like, I don't know what this had is for. And at that point I was trying to read the circles and I realized that I didn't understand. 
And so um, Jeremy said, this is what I do when I try to read the circles. And um, then he started showing me the diagram. So with that little intro, I'm gonna turn it over. <laughs> okay, great. So I get to show the circles? Yeah, yep, <laughs> that's the idea. So um, here's my screen and uh, my circle diagram. Now, I probably shouldn't have combined these in two things, but what I found is um, that the circle notation is, it's not intuitive to read because it's giving us a decimal representation with the number zero through seven of three qubits, which in binary, you know, can represent zero, zero, zero through one, one, one. And in order to kind of relate the decimal values to what the individual qubit values are, we get to do binary, um, I don't want to say binary math, but we need to break down the binary uh, parts of it to see it. And um, so when I first ran across the diagram in the book, which looks similar to the diagram here, you know, and, and that starts, you know, on page 73 is kind of where the, the author started doing this. And this shows for the decimal values, zero through seven, which bits are impacted. So if we look at, um, in this case, uh, we'll start with Bob, because Bob's kind of the easiest one <laughs> to uh, figure out. So Bob represents the, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to defer to somebody else. Is this the highest order bit in our little three bit thing, this one? Or is that the lowest order bit? I know Nuri can answer this. <laughs> I wanna say least significant bit. But... Okay, I'll go with least significant bit. Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, so if we're looking at this, we can, we can see here the values one through, or zero through three have uh, that bit being zero and the values four through seven have it being one. And so that's what this green square is. And I'm sorry if there's any colorblind people in the audience, I was having trouble with colors. So when the, the Bob qubit represents zero, then the possible outcomes based on the other two qubits are zero through three. No other qubits are possible because, or no other values are possible because otherwise Bob would need to be a one bit. And it's similar- I'm just gonna jump in and correct. Alice is the Alice is the least significant bit. Bob in this diagram Bob is, is highest is the significant. Most. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get confused because this most significant bit is that the highest order of magnitude or the least one? Yeah. I'm yeah. So, the, so the I'm, highest significant bit is the one that makes the biggest numeric quantitative difference. Okay, I'll there. say the one yeah. the one on the left. <laughs> and that way we don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the EP, which is our uh, entangled pair. So this is kind of how our, our two Alice and Qubit, or Alice and Bob Qubits can uh, meet in the middle, is the middle one. And so, you know, based on the squares, if we look, if EP is zero, then the possible values are zero, one, four, and five, the red square on the left. So um, again, zero, one, four, and five, where EP is zero and where it's one, it's these, um, the other values, two, three, six, seven. And then the Alice one is a little, um, it's harder to see on the diagram, but basically you can say even and odd. So if Alice is zero, then the value is even. If Alice is one, the value is odd. Uh, when we look at the, the decimal representation. So, Having this up while I step through the circuit diagram has been really helpful to me. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a good way to, um, to have this up and the program circuit up at the same time because of the way this web page is laid out. So I'm going to keep popping these open, which is kind of a pain. Uh, and uh, I just want to point out the prepare payload. Um, uh, Lynn and I were talking about this earlier, and in the book, this is 
a, an arbitrary representation. So this is just Alice putting the qubit into whatever state she wants to put it into. And it could be that she's getting it from another QPU uh, qubit. She could be getting it from another operation. It could be entangled somewhere else. This is just her um, orientation when she's uh, before she sends the, the qubit over. So the had phase 45 had, it doesn't mean anything significant other than we're gonna to wanna to know how to undo it when we get to the, um, the verify side. So um, I'm just gonna do a quick step through um, these again, as we kind of look at this diagram. Um, and that's gonna be painful. So uh, when we do the had on the EP bit, now we put basically this middle one into superposition and uh, so that has the effect of saying, okay, well now our value value, our possible values are zero or two um, because we're saying, okay, well, uh, EP is zero or EP is two. The other two bits, both Bob and Alice are zero. So those are the two possible values we have if we put the EP into superposition. Okay, pause there. I'm yeah. very curious from Matt and Nuri if that helps them. That was helpful to me because I did not understand that as, as clearly. I kind of had an intuition around it, but I wasn't doing the sort of binary breakdown like that. And I don't know if you guys already were, but I wasn't. And this was helpful to me. It is definitely helpful. Can you go over the last... 10 seconds of what you just said, because I was following you right until the very end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me click back here before the had. So before the had, um, actually we don't, I'm not gonna use the diagram for this. We'll look at the, these uh, binary representations that are spread out. So all of the qubits are initialized to zero. So initially um, all three of these, we have that 100% probability that if we read, we're going to get a zero. And that's why our first circle is full. When we had the EP qubit, what we're saying is this middle one, we're going to put into superposition, meaning it could be either a zero or a one. So if I look at this and say, okay, EP is zero, Bob and Alice are both zero because they've been initialized and they haven't changed. So that means the possible values right now are decimal zero or two because the EP value can be either zero or one, but the Bob and Alice values both have to be zero. So um, those, so that this ends up being our two options is either zero or two. And that's an interesting way of putting it. And mm -hmm. I may be off, but I may be, is it okay if I scribble on screen? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, it is helpful to look at this this way. So thank you. So it's critical observation that this and this are both gonna be zeros, Alice and Bob. So we're not gonna get any play from that initially. Right. right? And then because we're choosing the central column here, right? And I talk about this one as the interval selector, that kind of binds together these guys, right? Am I drawing it right? What's the next one? So, because this initial one had anything to do with anything, its pair, which is one away, had a chance of being anywhere. So we might get a value there. Anybody else's pairs have not been, had a chance to be anything and therefore they're still empty. Uh, yes. So that's, and, and we'll see why it's important to kind of fill in the circles before doing things. <laughs> once we get further on. But yeah, so basically these other circles aren't impacted because those are all zeros and um, you know, Bob and Alice will not be anything but zero at this point in time. 
And so after we do the had and get it into this superposition, we do the C knot and that now entangles the um, Bob qubit with the EP, our entangled pair. And so that, uh, with that, we have an entangled pair. And then we can move on and prepare Alice's qubit. Now, something that's interesting is there's a little comment in the code that says it doesn't matter which order we do these in. So we could prepare the payload first and do the Bob EP entangle second if we wanted to. And that's because right at this point, these first two sets of operations that we have are independent. Uh, the, the entangle deals with the EP Bob qubit and the prep payload deals with the Alice qubit. So if we reverse the order of these, it would still behave exactly the same. And so then uh, it gets fun here because when we had the Alice qubit, again, that will impact kind of the odd numbered ones that are related to um, what we have. So right now we have a zero and a six. And so if we had that, now we have a zero, one, six, seven. So it basically kind of took those even ones and, and hadded them out because now the Alice qubit is in superposition. So we had a, um, what did we have? We had a two. If Jeremy, could you animate, like put, put the cursor in the circuit just after the had, just before the had, so we can see how the pairing worked yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so just before, so this is after entanglement, uh, and then after we do the had, now putting the Alice qubit into superposition uh, impacts basically the, the two sets of values that have possible values at this point. I'm, I'm making it worse, aren't I? No, 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 no. It's good. It's good. Keep going. I think going. if you animate a couple more times just to see that relationship. Just the, that's this is the before. Yeah. No, you're in the yeah. after. Yeah. This is the and before. Then, so we have zero and six in something, right? In some kind of those, headiness. Those are possible values. Right. The, the empty circles are just not possible at this point. Right. And we're doing an operation I had on the first bit, the least significant, the one that has an right. interval so, of, of uh, adjacency, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And therefore, it makes it so that the previously, can you go previous? The previous was zero and six, and they're one away because we're doing an operation on the first line. So the interval selector is just adjacent, says spread your headiness on the one next to you. Mm -hmm. Your headiness, I like that one. And then we'll see something similar when we do the phase operation. So again, at this point, we see the, the odd numbered ones that are currently here just did a, a rotate of 45 degrees or. This is extremely helpful. I'm beginning to understand a little more. I can't say I got it, but I do understand a little more. And then if we do another hat, again, the same pairs are impacted, but because of the phase shift, um, we get different probabilities now. Now I'm not going to pretend to understand what I'm still not exactly sure how phase fits into things in the bigger picture. I'm expecting that will come clear in future chapters. I, but, I had the same question reading yeah. the book, which is the author made a, a point about saying they're only going to do a relative shift on the right hand side of the pair because it's relative to its uh, buddy. Um, but here they clearly did not. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to go with the flow on this. Okay, so again, here's our initial, and then the initial had spreads the hattiness, and then the phase will rotate the 45 degrees, and then we'll spread hattiness again. And again, had had is reversible, so that puts things back the way they were, but since we had the phase shift in the middle, we don't get exactly the same state that we had before. So magnitude, but not angle. Uh, is that? Uh, let's see. 
actually no because the magnitude is different. i'm saying that the hardness operates on the magnitude but not the angle well the angle has something to do with it but mm -hmm. i'm not exactly sure what yeah that is. it does it's the combination it's the state of the two but again book didn't explain it so just sort of get yeah. the intuition it has something to do with it and notice i just want to say at the end on the verify notice this pattern that we should be comfortable seeing mm -hmm. bob has to do the same thing but in reverse on the angle so it's the combination of the two um so okay cool so keep on going to the sim though because i want to get to the point where i was stuck because you helped me <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so uh now that alice has said this is the state i would like my qubit to be in now that qubit needs to be entangled as well and so that's where we are right here. So uh, in the first step, we learned that an entangle is a had C naught, right? And we got that from a previous chapter. Now, we don't necessarily need a had C naught in order to entangle a pair. But what we need is we need the, to have the control bit in some kind of superposition. So if the control bit is not in any kind of superposition, then the knot is just going to operate like we're used to in uh, classical programming. It's not going to do anything exciting. But if the control bit is in some type of superposition, then a C naught will entangle those. And so that's what's happening here. So even though we're not explicitly saying, okay, well, and to entangle Alice and the E and the entangled pair, we're not doing a had C naught. The Alice qubits are already in a superposition state. So if we do a C naught, then that has the effect of entangling Alice's qubit with the uh, entangled pair that we have in the middle. And that is such a bad name, EP, because now EP is entangled with both Alice and with Bob, just to make things fun. <laughs> so then the next step, um, is to do another had. And I think the, um, I'm gonna actually read from the book again because this is a little bit This is where I got, this is where I got stuck. This yeah, and I, I had stuck. to read it a couple of yeah, times. Yeah. Um, so in the book, this is on, this is step 3.2, which is on page 76. Mm -hmm. And so it says, to make the link that Alice has created for her payload actually useful, she needs to finish perf by performing a had operation on her payload, which is the step that we just did. Um, and this, um, let's see. Where did, uh, where did this go? It says right before the bottom, Jeremy, right before step three, three, if Alice hadn't yeah. applied the had, she would have destroyed right. the information. Yes. So if Alice hadn't applied the had, she would have destroyed magnitude and phase information when applying the read operations. Now, the read operations are required here because um, apparently, just like with Star Trek transporters, you have to destroy something as you're transporting it. You can't keep the original and send it somewhere else at the same time. So that's why there's these two read operations. And um, so at this point, if we do a read on Alice, we get a one. And if we do a read on the EP, we get a zero. And these values will are non-deterministic. So those could change depending on how things are feeling. So, so Lynn, what, what is the point here that was not clear. Why the, she had, the why reason? She had, why the she reason? Do, yeah, why she had to do the had. Uh -huh. And again, according to the book, if she had, if she had not done the had, then and if she just read, she would have destroyed the magnitude and phase information. And they say, try it. So remove mm -hmm. the had. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, because um, then that's where we went after this to figure it out. So one thing I want to point out before I remove it is if we look at our circles right now, we see we have potentials in 0, 3, 5, and 6. We have four circles that are currently empty. 
if we apply a hat at this point, now we have no empty circles. So all circles have some kind of potential and there's also a phase angle to them. And thing, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say the other thing I pointed out uh, is right when you do that had, our circles now, you can see with your cool fancy picture, um, Bob's and the EP are still entangled. So if you put your cursor, you see zero and one and six and seven are pretty matching. And then two, three, four and five are pretty matching. Mm -hmm. If you put your cursor right after we entangled um, Bob's. Right here. Yep. You can see the same pattern. Um, oh, maybe we're, we're right after. Well, I think we got that when we did this. There you go. And so, yeah, your little diagram, again, it's hard to wrap your mind around this, but one statement they made is once you entangle them, Bob and EP are now in um, complete uh, entanglement, complete agreement. And so when you had zero and six, looking at your diagram, if uh, EP is zero and Bob is zero, well, the only option you have is, um, if they agree, is either zero or six. I'm not explaining it well, but um, until you did her had, I still don't understand looking at the circuit diagram why that was required. But you can tell visually in the circles, the instant you do it, uh, Bob and EP now agree. So yeah, if you leave it there and you bring up your diagram, So zero, one agree, and six and seven agree. Notice that zero and one, Alice can be zero or one. Whatever she sent is going to come across. We'll figure out what that is when we read. But zero and one only occur when Bob is zero and EP is zero. Mm -hmm. If Bob yes. or EP change, now you're at six and seven. Two, three, four, and five are invalid states. Those aren't possible because we've entangled EP and Bob right from the get-go. And so really whatever Alice sends determines what Bob eventually gets. Um, and right when you clicked on that had for Alice, all of a sudden our circles are like, oh, that's what your cool paint diagram says. Zero and one and six and seven are related somehow. Two, three, four, five are also, but they're all going to go away, I assume, because those are invalid states. But um, yeah, I still don't know conceptually why that has necessary. I'm sure it has to sink in a little bit, but visually um, you can see it actually doing something here. At least well, again, if you go yeah. before the had, Jeremy, and then the, the, the intuition I got is there could be states where there's no information transferred. So the, the numbers one, two, four, and seven have nothing in them. And mm -hmm. so once you had it, if you click the had, and Jeremy, you said this to me, now every circle has information. So there's, there's no, there will be information transferred, which that was what I, that's how far I got from this. We're like, okay, this reduces the error because every circle has some information. Whereas if you have some circles with no information, that seems like it could be uh, not an optimal situation. See, so you guys went all logical on it. I thought, Maybe because the C knot has entangled, and by now, since we're entangling the third line, Alice's, they're all entangled, and there's no time relationship, meaning that things that those probabilities are still alive until we kill them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the notion that the had is after, the had is actually a buffer that says, I'm going to play with these probabilities. If you reverse the hat again and you read, you read what was in a C knot in theory. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you, can, if, if you, if you quote unquote destroyed without the hat, you destroyed line one. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you took it out of superposition, which kills the whole entanglement. Yeah. And that's what they said. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Well, that was a lot of work. Okay. So now we got there. Put the head back in. <laughs> yep. And so and keep going. Yeah. So the receive is interesting uh, because there's 
three different cases that are demonstrated here. Um, so this is where things differ from the IBM stuff, which we'll, we'll see in just a bit. But um, in, in this case, in order for Bob to, um, I'll say correctly decode the, the information he has, he needs to know the state of Alice's read and the EP read. So those, uh, the um, quantum state has been collapsed for those. If he has those two bits, uh, the read value, then he can decide whether he's going to apply a C naught and a CZ. So this is a C phase 180. And there's, this is kind of showing three different ways of doing it. If you look at up here, Bob is asleep, used conditionals, and there's an else. So uh, the idea of Bob is asleep, that means Bob cannot get the value of those two things. So Bob's just gonna do the same thing every single time. He's always going to apply the knot. He's always going to apply a phase 180, not a conditional knot and not a conditional phase 180, but always the knot, always the phase 180, which means that operation will not always be complete or correct uh, because that'll really depend on what the values of these two reads are, whether he should or should not apply those. And so um, that's what the, um, IBM quantum program does because it doesn't support kind of these uh, literal true false values that, that we're working with here. So um, it will only be correct a certain percentage of the time. The thing that's also kind of interesting is uh, there's this use conditionals, which is this else if, and there's this else. These actually do the same thing because what happens in the read so when Alice does a read, which is right here, uh, it's assigned to A1, a variable, a classical variable. And then the same thing when the EP is read, A2 is assigned a classical variable. So down in this third option, it's doing the, Bob's doing a not based on what the A2 value is. It's doing a phase 180 based on what the A1 value is. And this second one is doing exactly the same thing, only we can see it in the diagram. <laughs> because this C naught based on EP is based on the outcome of this value. So even though the line kind of stops after the read, it's still doing it based on, okay, well, EP is zero. So this not will not be applied in this case. And then for the, the C phase 180, since this is a zero, it will not be applied in this case. So um, one of these is tying it to the diagram. And if we were to not tie it to the diagram, uh, then we'll, we'll see like a phase 180 and a not being applied sometimes and sometimes not, but it actually depends on what these values are. <laughs> So if, there, if the Alice is a one, the phase will be applied. If EP is a one, the not will be applied. And so if I run this multiple times, okay, so Alice is one, so the phase is applied. EP is zero, so the not is not applied. So um, I think this, this is, is, I think this is clear if you now switch to the IBM, because it's, yeah. the, the deal is in um, the IBM implementation, you can't use an if statement. They're not right. allowed. And so show that because that's interesting. And then show well, them all the ones. Let, let me show this because this is what the IBM one is going to do. So we'll set the Bob is asleep to true. So the phase and the not will always be applied. Mm -hmm. And if we run this, we'll see that um, what we're expecting this final read to be is a zero because that's what Alice is putting in on this end. So when we have a zero, then we potentially did the correct thing. <laughs> And in fact, if we look at this, uh, let, let's get a state here. Uh, so when these both result in ones, then doing this is the correct thing to do. And so Bob will get the correct value. However, if either one of these values is zero, then this is not the correct thing to do. And so this value will potentially be incorrect. But again, it's 
um, not something we can look at directly. Uh, let's flip over to the IBM. And I ran a couple jobs earlier. Um, let's see. I'm going to look at the one that I ran a month ago first because uh, for the values, I got the same values that were in the book <laughs> completely by accident. Okay, so here's where things get, I'll use the word fun because you'll notice that we have. Um, kind of the same thing that we have here. The IBM quantum computer has five bits, uh, five qubits, but you'll notice that the it's, it's only using every other one. So let's look at this last thing um, to start with. So here's a one, zero, one, zero, one. So the, I'll call them the in-betweener bits are always zeros. And then if we look at the outer bit and the middle bit, those are subject to change because those are the bits that are in play. Now to make things exciting, this is actually the opposite. <laughs> so Bob is actually the, the one on the right. I'm not gonna say least significant, most significant. He's the one on the right in this notation, <laughs> uh, just to make things confusing. Um, so in this situation, Bob always applies a, um, okay, using control. Uh, Bob always applies this um, uh, not phase operation. So he's doing that all the time. And so that means that Bob doesn't always do the right thing. And in fact, these first five states that we have here are Bob doing the wrong thing. So uh, these, uh, these first five, we just have to chuck those out because Bob is not decoding properly. Now, these last two are ones where Bob is decoding properly. But even here, we notice in this case, uh, Bob's value is zero, which is the correct value that that's the one that Alice put in originally. That happened 194 times out of the 1,024 times that we ran this. But Bob was wrong 27 times. And again, I'm just so, going to hold this up if you haven't seen yeah. the book. So can you guys all read this? This is on page um, 80. Um, so this actually shows that diagram. Can you see it? The end is the only significant, the last two. So if you have the book, you might want to look in there too. And the first sections, as Jeremy was saying, have to get thrown away. Yeah, so these are ones where we did the wrong thing, Bob did the wrong thing. And so these are the only ones that could possibly be correct. But even though we did the correct thing, theoretically, we don't 100% get the answer we expect. So, so again, I'm just gonna read from the yeah. book here. Of the 221 times when Bob did the correct thing, the teleportation succeeded when Bob's verification read gave a value of zero. This means the teleportation succeeded 194 times, failed 27. The success rate of 87.8 .8 is not bad, considering Alice and Bob are using the best available equipment, da, 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 da. And then the next thing in the book says, how is teleportation actually used? Teleportation is a surprisingly fundamental part of the operation of a QPU. Even in straight computational applications that have no obvious communication aspect, it allows us to shuttle information between qubits while working around the no copying constraint. So that's, if you, to me, that's sort of the big concept here. You can't copy. And so you can probabilistically teleport. That's how I take this. In fact, most practical uses of teleportation over very short distances within a QPU as an integral part of quantum applications. In the upcoming chapters, you'll see the most quantum operations for two or more qubits function by form various entanglement. The use of such quantum links to perform computation can be seen as an application of general concept of teleportation. So that was sort of like, I had that intuition. I was missing a lot of the mechanics, um, but that's how I take this as sort of our introduction to teleportation. Yeah, so, so anywho, so uh, again, um, like Jeremy and I were saying today, we all knew what we signed up for here. So um, I'm, I'm feeling like, uh, personally, if I can just move the bar a little bit more forward, realizing that becoming a quantum programmer is a big journey. I mean, typically it's a multi-year degree program in, in university. 
<laughs> so um, I'm feeling comfortable with just getting more of an intuition. I'm hoping that that's you know, meeting the group's needs. So my vote is to kind of just keep plugging ahead, you know, just kind of you know, go look at next week and see if any of these tools or ideas will help us with these visual or mental representations. Um, and um, you know, the hardest thing is to accept the limitations of knowledge that, that we're on this learning ladder. I know I feel it too. I, I was like, should I just do the math? Should I, just, should I just do all this math? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not in a university class. So, I mean, I think at some point, you know, if you want to turn this into reality, you do have to uh, do that work. But um, I'm still feeling the learning ladder. So I would propose that we just kind of go in uh, chapter five, which has shorter examples. There is another example of this teleportation, but um, I kind of want to move beyond this if everybody's feeling cool about it and just kind of get into chapter five, work through code examples and kind of, since we're such a small group, just kind of do it organically, kind of like what we've been doing. Does that sound like a good plan for next week? Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah.